Thank you. Um, this is based partially on some work I did in my PhD, uh, but I was only looking at Ireland and the Neolithic to the early Bronze Age. So I've sort of expanded to Britain and Ireland. Uh, you will note the change of title. Uh, British Isles is too political, <laughs> so it's Britain and Ireland, it's not British Isles. Um, but yeah, it's I've tried to incorporate sort of the, till the end of the Bronze Age to try and give us some potential changes and that sort of thing. Um, so sort of starting off, I'm going to start off with a little sort of divergence into what calendars actually are. Rich has asked me not to spend too long on this and to focus more <laughs> on the animal stuff, but uh, I think it's quite essential for us to understand what a calendar is before we can talk about calendars. So this is sort of an a overview of what calendars are. We've got empirical calendars, so they're very direct observation sort of things. Then you've got calculated calendars. These being based on lunar, lunisolar, solar, and wandering year sort of structures. I'm not going to go into this in a huge amount of detail. Um, historically, lunisolar calendars are the most frequent in Eurasia. I'm not going to start talking about the Americas, Africa, that sort of thing. They're actually the most common there as well. But in terms of our Eurasian, situation, lunar solar calendars seem to be the most regular. Our sort of solar calendar that we use today is actually quite, on a worldwide um, level, quite unusual, on a historical level, quite unusual. It's very, as I will go into it, very improbable that they were using a solar calendar in the Neolithic or the Bronze Age. They may have changed one at some point, but on a, let's say, historical basis, it's, it will be very unusual for them to be using a purely solar calendar. So, the Babylonian calendar. It's the one that we have the most information on in the earliest time period. Uh, it was based on lunar cycles divided into two seasons, cultivation and harvest. Each season, six lunar months alternating length. Uh, from at least 2400 BC, they're using sort of a calculation method of adding a 13th month every few years to sort of reconcile the lunar and the solar sort of uh, differences. Uh, in terms of their cyclical face festivals, they're based on seasonal change and the solar year, and the New Year festival was the winter solstice. Um, in general terms, aside from some variations in Greek states, and then some variations in some of the Mediterranean areas, on a European-wide basis, and even <coughs> in parts of the Near East and parts of Asia, um, this is basically the structure that we can see in the earliest historical records. So something similar to this is probably what you're kind of looking at in prehistoric times. If we look at the Egyptian calendar, before 3500 BC, you had a loony solar calendar already in use based on monument orientations and that sort of thing. They were using the Sothic year, um, which was, it starts at the beginning of the rising of Cirrus, which is connected with the inundation <coughs> in the Nile. Um, but they also had a separate uh, New Year's festival at the winter solstice. So even within the Sothic year, it suggests they don't just have one single calendar in use. Um, by the mid third millennium BC at least, they're using two calendars. With the common year, being based on lunar months, in addition to the lunar solar calendar. By the middle of the second millennia BC, they'd added a civil calendar, which was exclusively administrative. <coughs> so whereas the other calendars were related to um, religious change and change in economy and things like that, when I get to the civil calendar, it was purely administrative. It was basically a solar year, 365 days, and then we start our tax year again, basically. So we had three parallel calendars, but the New Year's uh, festival of winter solstice was always a main sort of focus in terms of a religious ceremonial year. It's something that we also saw in the Babylonian calendar. So the Celtic calendar, a little bit strange. Uh, we do have the change to uh, <coughs> visions being primarily on the changing of the seasons. So spring, summer, autumn, winter, rather than the six months divides that you saw in the Babylonian calendar, two big seasons with the winter solstice 
and the sum of sources being the main divisions. Um, again, you've got uh, adjustments for discrepancies in the lunar and the solar calendar uh, every 25 to 30 years. Um, Caesar recorded <coughs> um, that the, let's say, Celtic peoples, whatever you want to call them, the Gallic peoples, uh, people in Britain, maybe Ireland as well, they, were, they had a 30 year calendar. And based on the Kalinli calendar, it does seem that there was a 30 year sort of division in terms of your long term calendar. But in terms of your year, it was four seasons, <coughs> two halves, and even though the Imbolc, Samhain, etc. was quite important, the winter solstice still remained a key feasting time and may have remained the basic changing of some sort of calendar year. In traditional European folk calendars, um, primarily divided by seasonal, uh, divided into two halves with some sort of degree of flexibility due to variances in the seasonal change. So when the seasons change naturally around a certain period of time, then the calendar sort of kicks in. It's a little more sort of free and easy, sort of rolling with it. Uh, the informal things being sort of the natural beginnings of spring and autumn, dividing the year into halves, but regular or formalized turning points are sort of imposed. We have to commemorate the changing of the calendar at some point, you know, regularly. So they do use Christian feast days. A lot of these were pre-Christian origins. So although your actual, let's say, economic year may be somewhat flexible, you still try to mark it somewhat formally so you can keep things somewhat regular. So in terms of putting a framework in place for looking at the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, uh, you're probably looking at using the equinoxes and the <coughs> solstices and the changing of the seasons. Uh, from here on out, I'm going to use the historic uh, Celtic uh, terms for the turning of the seasons. Just a shorthand, I don't think you're looking at sort of these sort of festival days being marked necessarily in the Neolithic, for, for instance, but in terms of saying the beginning of spring, it's just all a bit convoluted. Um, in terms of the equinoxes and the periods around that, something you see in the historic calendars is not necessarily the day itself, it's the period of time around it. So in a lot of calendars, uh, the changing of the year, changing of seasons is based on the lunar months that start around the solstices and around the equinoxes. So you're able to calculate your lunar months a lot easier than identify your exact day of equinox in uh, very traditional sort of societies. So, beginning of lunar months, usually the first parent of a crescent moon, <coughs> less frequently the new or waning moon. In the Egyptian lunar months, uh, it was the old crescent waning moon, uh, no longer being visible at dawn, so change of the months. Uh, beginning of the year or seasons, this would be around the solstice or equinox being changed. For prehistoric Europe, there have been some different sort of periods of time suggested. Uh, De Silva in 2004 suggested the rising of the full moon. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of that. In terms of looking at uh, archaeological monuments in Europe, the only place that has actually looked at megalithic tombs and that sort of thing from a perspective that actually looks at the beginning of lunar months potentially is in the TRB and they have actually identified some sort of evidence for the lunar months around before and after the equinoxes being some things that they were actually targeting. So it does suggest in the Neolithic, in large parts of Central and Northern Europe, that some of these sort of calendrical um, ideas, frameworks were already present. So in terms of a seasonal economic calendar, in a prehistoric context, you're probably talking about it being divided into two halves with a degree of flexibility due to the variances of seasonal change, with the beginning of each half being marked by the natural beginnings of spring and autumn, possibly combined with the equinoxes. But the structure of this year in terms of economic practice, you're talking about a nine month and three month uh, division. It's <coughs> something that we do see in mythology as well, in some of the stories, um, both in Britain, Ireland, and in some of the continental mythologies, but I'm not here to talk about mythology, so I won't go into it. Um, but the divisions are probably primarily based on around lunar months, as they are in pretty much all historical calendars for a seasonal economic year. You could have regular formalized turning points with lunar events being before or after the equinoxes to put some sort of shape on things. 
We also might have a cyclical ceremonial or religious calendar, with the primary focus or turning point of this being the winter solstice, this being the most easily predictable and observable. From a symbolic perspective, the winter solstice is the rebirth of the sun, and the summer solstice is the death of the sun. So you got the beginnings of light half and dark half of the year, uh, not in terms of, uh, it's, it's largely symbolic when it comes to the summer solstice, but it is the start of the dark half of the year, pretty much. And then with the winter solstice, it's sort of uh, foreshadowing the beginning of spring. Um, other festivals, probably other important points of prayers of the economic calendar, with an additional <coughs> astronomically defined points of the year, possibly as well. From an economic, economic perspective, the winter is the most convenient time as well to bring large numbers of people together, and an ideal time to share or redistribute resources or among or between communities. So, animals. In terms of, let's say, general exploitation patterns, there are some variances um, <coughs> between the Neolithic and later Bronze Age. I'm not really going to outline this too heavily right now, um, but when I come to sort of show sort of a, a yearly division, uh, in terms of framework, it's possible to look at different areas different periods and then try and work out which parts of the calendar may be m more important on a regional or local basis. As well with your uh, crops, we do have regional variations and that sort of thing. The only one that I'm really going to focus on today is the change around about 1500 BC when we do seem to have a lot more focus on cultivation. So. In terms of Britain and Ireland and a composite sort of yearly um, calendar, we're probably some, looking at something along these sort of lines. Um, in terms of maritime travel, that's sort of taking into <coughs> account the um, tides, seasons, that sort of thing. When is it easiest to travel between the continent, Britain, Ireland, etc.? <coughs> For the um, marine resources, the light blue is probably when most of the exploitation is happening, darker blue, and then, etc. cetera, um, <coughs> still exploitation possible. Uh, in terms of your birds, I don't have it up there. It's not something I've looked. Uh, it's very complicated. Next time. <laughs> um, but in general terms, you are looking at a very similar sort of pattern to the um, marine resources. Um, <coughs> Arixon do sort of disappear by the middle Neolithic. Um, with the wild boar in Ireland, they disappear by the middle Neolithic. So there are some sort of changes and in different parts of Britain and Ireland. You see different sort of uh, animal exploitation over time. So just to mention about the fish and that sort of thing, um, this is based on basically the easiest periods of time to exploit these animals. Um, inshore fishing, when they're breeding, um, when they're close to shore, because um, some of them will be present for longer <coughs> times, but not as easy to export. So we do see some sort of variations in this. And if you get down to a local and regional level, you can start pulling this apart as well. So looking at Neolithic and Bronze Age Ireland, wild boar and the appearance of horses are the main differences between Neolithic to early Bronze Age and later Bronze Age. In terms of other exploitation, honey has not been recorded in Neolithic or Bronze Age Ireland yet, but if it is being exploited, that's the period when it would be. Um, wild boar, it's only very small amounts that we seem to be turning up in the archaeological record. Again, marine resources in both the Neolithic and Bronze Age, very regional. Uh, again, we don't have honey yet. Wild nuts and fruits and berries, definitely in some places, in the later Bronze Age, but not everywhere. So things you can sort of tick off. For pig breeding, they sort of disappear from the end of the early Bronze Age or thereabouts in most regions, only to reappear as a very important resource towards the end of the Bronze Age and into the Iron Age. So for a large portion of the Middle Bronze Age, pigs do not seem to be a particularly important resource. So there are certain things you can sort of tick off and say, oh, that mightn't be so important in my site, in my area. So for Britain as well, very similar sort of pattern. 
Ericsson disappear after the early Bronze Age. Again, your marine might be a bit different in some places. Uh, as I said, pig breeding in Britain as well, sort of different with the horse breeding and foaling sort of coming in as well. So this is some of the primary animal exploitation, crop exploitation in the later Bronze Age in Britain and Ireland. Um, this bit here is quite important. We do not see that so much in the Neolithic, where you have exploitation of animals, focusing on any sort of feasting, as particularly around Bialtana, which I think is a key point. And we also have the importance of crop harvesting increasing. We have horse breeding appearing. Horse breeding, in terms of mythology, is huge and connected, particularly with Bialtana, which is at the height of your horse breeding season and the height of your foaling season. So in terms of different animals giving birth or going into reproductive activity, Bialtana is really the key time for it. So if we are getting a period when this is becoming even more important, it's going to be after the horse arrives. Like whatever about your milking and your cattle, I think it's when horses and <coughs> horse breeding sort of enters the mix that, and the increase in crop cultivation that is probably what sort of ignites the use of Celtic calendar sort of aspects. If we look earlier, uh, we've got various uh, alignments at Newgrange, North and South. Uh, looking at them in relation to this, you've got the spring, or sorry, the summer and winter solstices marked at Newgrange, down south and possibly down, down east. At North, the periods around the equinoxes, uh, still some problems about how they've looked at the orientations, but the way that they're looking, it's probably looking at a lunar dates around the equinoxes. So it's probably looking at an economic calendar year uh, rather than looking at this, the equinox itself. Uh, we also have South North uh, orientation problematic, but you're probably talking start and end of the economic year being March as well. So I think in your Neolithic, probably into the early Bronze Age, that's probably the primary structure of your yearly calendar. It's also turning up at Loch Crew, another past tomb cemetery, pretty much the same uh, parts of the year are being marked. So I think with a degree of confidence without knowing every single orientation, uh, it's prob quite probable that this is something you could see in various locations. Uh, we also have monuments with so-called imprecise or disputed alignments, but could looking at them from this sort of perspective shed some sort of new light. Uh, this site in Sligo, in northwest of Ireland, primary um, monument orientation is on summer solstice, so part of this economic year, part of this religious year. It also starts accepting light around Bialtana and just before the autumn equinox. I don't think it's hitting Bialtana necessarily. I think it's probably to do with cattle breeding um, and possibly some sort of connections with milking, cattle breeding and maybe red, red deer exploitation. So you've got antler shedding and fawning potentially being marked as well in this. Uh, down south, you've got winter solstice and these two points being marked. In this instance, it might be a particular connection with pig breeding. And if we look at maize how you've got the winter solstice and these two points. So beginning and end of economic year and a focus on the winter solstice. That's it in sort of a British context for the Neolithic, but that's it in a context for the local. So going into sort of the regional or local, and there's very little evidence for your pigs on the islands. So if you were to connect to some sort of symbolic fashion, you're probably looking at a particular <coughs> connection with sheep breeding, I think. So sheep breeding, finishing, lambing, kidding, starting. And I do think there are some hints that there is a particular importance of sheep in the um, economic practices of people up on Earth. So to conclude, I think in terms of framework, seasonal economic calendar divided into two halves, degree of flexibility, beginning of each half, probably spring, autumn, structure of the year being nine months, three months, um, with some sort of regular or formal turning points, uh, 
occurring with the lunar months around the equinoxes, with the cyclical ceremonial religious calendar, primary turning point, winter solstice, other festivals being parts of the economic year, and other additionally economically defined astronomically defined points. The Celtic calendar may have emerged during the later Bronze Age, following the increased importance of crop cultivation and the introduction of horses. References across quarter days not observable or easy to predict and are difficult to calculate. So I think even those Neolithic monuments where they might be hitting around those sort of periods, they're actually looking at seasonal change, not at those particular dates. Thank you.